So we're going to start with a, a brief PowerPoint presentation. Um, we're going to hop over to look at some specific candidate files, and then we're going to open it up for your questions. So we're going to start right now. I'm going to hop right over. I think I'm going to go to the whole screen. Okay. Um, get out of here and pull this up. All right. And we're going to do slideshow. Here we go. All righty. So relaunching in 2023. I wrote a check the other day. And I wrote 19 when I was writing the date. <laughs> Scary, huh? State of um, so we want to talk to you today about looking at your career break as an asset instead of how you may feel, which is that it's a liability. Yeah. And one of the things that we really believe so strongly is for each of you that learn these tools and these methods that we're teaching right now, mm -hmm. you are a woman who is going to go out into the workforce and change it because every single one of you needs to look at your time away as an asset. Mm -hmm. And um, we feel strongly our students that are out there doing this. And we know it's true people. now yes. because we've had so many students land. Yeah. Um, so let's move. Yeah, let's move through here. Um, so a little bit about us. Kelly and I are both mothers of four. Mm -hmm. I dropped a toddler off at uh, preschool today and I dropped a 19 year old off at, uh, at college. Yeah, at college. Yeah, you went ahead. Okay. All right, there we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that we both took career breaks and we have successfully returned mm -hmm. to work. We now have a combined 40 years of experience between the two of us helping women navigate work and life transitions. Yeah, we're seen as experts in this field, this particular lane. Um, career returns. And most of the big players in this space, which tend to be the job boards, come to us for their advice. So it's just kind of good to, to tuck that away. Um, we also have extensive recruiting and hiring manager experience and that those insights can be, be very helpful in helping you, the candidate, understand what's happening on the other side of the desk. Yeah. And this is probably what we're most proud of, but we really have helped our clients, our students from across the globe mm -hmm. um, land really great jobs after a career break. Every continent now, except for Antarctica. <laughs> and I think they're too cold to get up. Um, so let's just start from the most basic essential step. And that is that we know that relaunching a career is hard because we did it ourselves, but some mindsets make it much harder. Yeah, we can, the way that we talk to ourselves through this process really can be the biggest obstacle to a successful return. Mm -hmm. You may not think that that bleeds through when you are networking or you're interviewing, but it does. Mm -hmm. And so you have to start from the very beginning thinking about how you're speaking to yourself about your return, because it really does get mile mileage mm -hmm. as you move through this mm -hmm. process. So one of the ones that we hear a lot yeah. is I've been out too long. It's, it's always a never enough, right? Like I'm never enough. I'm not, you know, I'm just not mm -hmm. there enough yet. Or I'm too old or, yeah. you know, anything, yes. this, this, whatever your arbitrary number of years is too long. Right. And you know, it's, 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 I don't want to say it's a cop out, although I wrote that on the slide. Mm -hmm. It's really just, it's an easy default mindset, but the fact is that it's really not true. It's not true. And people return, women return to work at all ages. And we have students over 60 returning to work and after breaks of all lengths, including over 25 years. Absolutely. So just get that mindset out. And if someone else says it to you, you need to silence them too. Yes. There is such value to there being multi-generations in our mm -hmm. workforce that only benefits to it being more dynamic and more powerful. Mm -hmm. And so we need all mm -hmm. aspects in the workforce, all age groups right. in the workforce. That's so right. number two is I can't compete. And this comes up because there's the tech age that's happened mm -hmm. maybe since. So I think the biggest thing is that people are worried that too much has changed while they've been out. And the thing, the fact is things have changed, but, but you've also kept up because even if you started your career in accounting and you may not be using Excel to do pivot tables, you're still using Excel to schedule your kids' activities or do the family books. So you are, believe it or not, on, maybe on a, on a smaller scale, though, continuing to, to develop those tech skills. But tech is only a, big, a small part of it. You really never will compete with the digital native. Neither will we. No. I mean, there are if, if a child is 22 and grew up with a computer in his hands, we aren't going to compete on that level. But the fact of the matter is we need people in the workplace that can do more than that. And what you bring that digital native can never bring right. the institutional knowledge, the maturity, the interpersonal skills, the attention span. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of things that we bring. And as Kelly mentioned, that intergenerational workplace, it's a new phenomenon within the last 10 years that we have five generations working at the same time. And I actually do some corporate work teaching companies how to make it work for them, because there are a lot of, of long-held beliefs about what the young person is like, 
Mm -hmm. You know, they're lazy, they don't pay attention, they don't show up, they quit. And the old people who are clueless, they're out to lunch, they move too slow, they don't know how to use a computer. And all of those things are easily dispelled once the intergenerational synergy happens. So as Kelly mentioned earlier, not only are we seeing people work being brought into work at older ages, but CEOs, senior executives are staying into their 70s. Right. And that makes it all better for all of us. Yeah. And, you know, we have the unique experience of having all of these relaunchers go back into the right. workforce and then come back and tell us all the inside mm -hmm. stories and the inside scoop of what's happening. One of the students who you'll hear about later oh, yeah, down Roseanne. the road, yeah. um, Roseanne, she, um, she's kind of like, she's like, I'm kind of like the den mom, you yeah. know, yeah. When, on the team. And I really like, I just bring, you know, this perspective sometimes that this younger generation really mm -hmm. does benefit from. And then at the same time, she's like, and then they're tutoring me on how to use whatever computer program. And that's good leadership that yes. they even were able to create that kind of synergy from the yes. get-go. That's great. And then the last one that we really hear so often is that my resume gap is all anyone can see. And that's really where we're going to place our focus right. today. And it's true. It is all anyone will see until you fill it. Yes. And that's why you're here today. We're going to talk about how to fill that gap so that you're showing that you have done meaningful work during that period of time that you've been out, whether it's two years or 22 years. Exactly. Um, we want you to recognize it first yourselves and claim it because until you really believe and internalize that message that what I have done as a caregiver, as a, as a gig worker, as a volunteer matters, no one else is going to buy it until you do. Yeah. Okay. And what we want to encourage you to do today is start to think about it from this perspective. It's my job as I move through the job seeking process to educate mm -hmm. the work, you know, the hiring managers mm -hmm. and the companies or corporations that I might be targeting about who I am and exactly what I bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And it's very valuable gap included. And as we mentioned earlier, with this perspective of having worked on the other side of the desk, we can tell you with authority, both from the experiences we've heard from our students, but also as hiring managers ourselves, that those experiences matter. If they're presented properly, they do matter and they do, they're valued. Yeah. All right. Next up. So what we're going to do today is share the five steps for presenting your career break. Um, experiences and skills as an asset, not a liability. Yeah. And then we always like to give you case studies so that you can see real women who are out there and they've made the return and what their story and trajectories were. We actually just started a new series on our YouTube channel yeah. um, where we're interviewing returners um, that just hearing other people's stories can be so inspirational, mm -hmm. especially as you are doing this for yourself. Exactly. And then lastly, we were built at a fair amount of time at the end so we can answer your questions about how best to present your career break experience, but also if you have any questions about anything career relaunch related, we want you to ask that then. So we'll hop right in. Yes. So we're going to take you through three steps, five, and, break, actually. Uh, five steps yep. and break them down for you as we go. So step one is we need you to mine your career pause history. And what we mean is like dig in to that. So I mean, we're big believers in like pen and pen, pencil and paper to start writing things down, right? Yes. Just to start thinking about what have I done as a volunteer, right? right? So starting there. Yeah, yep. starting there. Yeah. So what have you done in your community? What have you done in your children's schools, your place of worship, on a nonprofit board? All of those things just start writing down, what have I done? Yeah. And then what have you done as a gig worker? So really think about all of these gigs. And let's talk a little bit about so what real a gig even looks like because you might one, give it the time of day. That's right. A common one would be, we see this a lot. Well, my husband's family owns a company, I do the books. Or my husband's family owns a company and I do all of the HR and employee relations. So any of those husband's family or husband owns a company, I'm doing X. When you're not on the payroll, that still counts as work. Even if you're just being consulted on a periodic basis. Um, maybe you're doing some work for a friend. Maybe your sister owns a company and you're auditing the HR manual every year, or your neighbor has a company and you accompany him or her to do their trade show. Again, whether it's paid or unpaid doesn't matter. We don't really, we look at work. We look at what you're doing and not whether it's paid um, because that's really kind of incidental to the fact that you're doing the work. Um, you may have done some barter or pro bono work. You know, I've done coaching for clients and then they've given me free, you know, I did one for um, this woman who gives great facials and her son needed some help. <laughs> so I helped him with his resume and his LinkedIn and she gave me free facial. So that if I were not working right now, I would count that as paid as, as professional work. Um, we had one student who did 
one thing every year and it was an onboarding for new employees at the yeah. beginning of the year because it was a company that only uh, hired on a one-year cycle that counts she did it for one year for 12 years or for one day for 12 years so she didn't just say well I uh, once a year I do this she said I am the onboarding specialist for this manufacturing company and I teach x y and z and these are my results right okay so the next place to look is what you have done as a caregiver this is really really important mm -hmm. and is something that is a great place to dig into because so much mm -hmm. of your time has probably been spent as a caregiver but how do you take that how do you take that information yep. and then um if you've had that. really significant caregiving responsibilities too then it can preclude you from having time to do these other things right and one of our examples today is a student who really only could do caregiving so but think about the things that you've done if you've had a homeschool we've had a number of yeah. uh, women come through who've been homeschoolers because their children had some learning disabilities and they weren't being addressed well in the schools maybe you've advocated for special services from from the schools for your child yeah um, maybe you've cared for a sick or disabled family member these are all things maybe you've been POA or an executor for a state, maybe you had elderly parent care. So all of these things count as experience. And we're not asking you at this point, if ever, and any of you have ever worked in a big company where you're doing like a brainstorming session, you're not judging here. You're not eliminating, you're just writing everything down. Yeah. That's where so it starts. Those guiding questions will help you think um, in a more clear way about when you're mining for that career pause experience, right. where to start. Okay. So step two is to label the skills and experience you've developed through these career pause roles. So let's break that down a little bit. What we want you to do is first start with the general. So you're going to consider things in that more general sense. Right. So let's talk about. Well, and the reason to do it is because we may have language that we use to describe something um, in say on a PTO board that is softer, maybe doesn't have the same panache as the business word. So we want you to think of how does how can I label what I've done in a way that sounds more right. relevant to the company or the organization I want to join or the field I want to be in? Right. So the general skills might include leadership, interpersonal skills, organizing things, um, supporting or providing administrative um, services to an event or activity or board. Right. And then you want to go to the specific. Mm -hmm. So like really getting more granular here. More into like the function. So let's say you are the bookkeeper for the school P or the treasurer for the school P PTO. That's financial management. It's all the assets. It's the accounting. It's the treasury. It's the cash management. It's the financial reporting. Again, it's a smaller scale than it would be if you're working for a major corporation and being a CFO, but it's the same work. It's the same Right. Um, activities, Functions. right? Human resources. Now, human resources is obviously its own function, but if you're managing volunteers, that's human resources. That's the recruiting of volunteers. That's the onboarding of volunteers. That's the assessing and, and managing and assigning. Mm -hmm. That is considered HR. Marketing and communications. If you're writing a newsletter, we see a lot of our moms coming through say, well, I was the marketing person. I was the one that put the brochures together, or I did the development. The website. Work. Right. Or, yeah. Website. Um, some have done automated newsletters, um, e-newsletters. Some have done the development work going out and canvassing. Some have done PR. I know when I was in the PTO, I did all PR. I wrote press releases. I did press interviews. I brought the press into things. Yeah. Um, this is also like happening in their place of worship. Exactly. That's another place I where did you might church. go. Yeah, yep, yep. exactly. Um, property or facilities management. So you may have a rental property that you run. You may have GC'd a construction project. Those are all things. Those are skill, work skills that matter. And I think the last one is probably very common with a lot of the women that come to our programs, and that is event planning. Yeah, it was so interesting. I was um, talking to my best friend. She works for Johnson & Johnson, and she does major events for the company um, on my way after dropping off my son this morning. And she said, so what are you doing today? And I said, oh, we're yeah. doing this webinar for these women. And um, and she said, she we were talking about, she's a big volunteer in her community. And she said, I have to tell you, she's like, I've been working in corporate for a long time now. Mm -hmm. And she says, it is much easier to run a corporate event. If there's, there's money, there's, there's resources, there's yeah, all the right. things you don't have as well. There, there ever is um, when you're <laughs> exactly. trying to do something in your community on a shoestring budget with limited resources. Mm -hmm. so, yeah.
Okay. All right. So number three is to write out your accomplishments. All right. Now here is when you put pen to paper. Okay. So what did you personally accomplish? So Susan, this can get really tricky for, for, yeah, because most of you don't really feel like, like you want to claim that you've done anything. So thinking about the activities, I automated the book. So moving kind of from that last step, yep. so let's say you said you did, you know, financial management. Well, I automated the books yep. and the payment processing. We've had a number of students come through and say, well, I didn't really do anything. And then we asked them, well, I was a, you know, I was the treasurer of the preschool. It's not that very big. Well, what did you do? Well, we didn't have, we were using a paper ledger. So I put everything in Excel and we were using checks, but then I set up a PayPal account. Those are all things that matter. Um, created and analyzed a database. A lot of, like to Kat's point, yeah. her friend's name is Kat, a lot of volunteer boards don't have access to data mm -hmm. um, or they don't have time to look at the data or they don't know how. So maybe you did that to help make things more efficient or to get some good intel. Um, maybe you conceived of, wrote and distributed a newsletter. Absolutely. Maybe you lobbied a school district to adopt some new e-learning tools. We've had a couple of students come through yes. where- they had a child that needed some special tools to learn, adaptive full learning. capacity, mm -hmm. but needed some adaptive learning tools. And this one lobbied a major city's school system mm -hmm. to have them adopted. So she could just write that off and say, well, you know, my kid had a learning disability and make sure they got the software. But instead, she thought of it differently. She thought, wait a second, by doing that, by lobbying the school system, by using my sales skills to convince the school system and the board to invest, I think it was in the six figures for this program, I was helping all children yes. who need some adaptive learning Anybody services. Anybody who comes after. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the we also mentioned GCing a private construction project. So it's another, and these are just five examples. There are so many more. Okay. And then you want to think about, well, what did your team accomplish? What right. was actually accomplished? So you might not be, group? you might not feel comfortable, for example, on that first bullet saying that by automating the books and using PayPal, I grew our membership and our participation right. or I grew our revenue. That might be something where you could use the we, right? When you're talking, say, well, I did all of this and this allowed us to grow membership yeah. and to um, grow participation because once people can, it's so true too. If it's writing a check, we might get a $50 donation, but when people can just connect it to their PayPal yeah. and it's it's hundred bucks, people think less when it's, when it's just pushing a yeah. button as opposed to writing a check. Yeah. Um, maybe increasing, increasing efficiencies, by automating things, improving processes. Um, you met aggressive targets, right? Before that, whether they be financial targets or numeric targets or percentage targets. Um, and then for those more hands-on kind of like the GC example, you know, I completed the project or we completed the project, you leading with the subcontractors doing the work, completed the project under budget and ahead of schedule. Right. Okay. So we first talk about what you've accomplished, right? right? Be it personally or with a team. Mm -hmm. And now this is a really important mm -hmm. step. So don't miss this piece of it. What impact did the project or event have? You want to articulate right. that. So you could say, whether it be work experience or volunteer experience, but using the volunteer example, um, we grew, I grew membership um, from 200 to 400 paying members, right? That's great. But the impact is that we were then able, let's say this was a land trust, we were then able to finally have enough money to negotiate with that landowner to buy four acres adjacent to our park. That's the impact. That's the piece that makes me think, oh, that's why that matters. Right, okay. All right, so step number four is to quantify them using scale and context. This is hard. This is and where so we want you to yeah. know that this is not an easy thing yeah. to do. This is where we really like yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard to do. So you want you want to do your best to align each accomplishment with a metric. Right. So, so you want to think of all of the ways that your results can be measured or quantified. So here are some examples: tickets sold, revenue raised, donors engaged. Um, then on the negative side or the saving side, money saved, resources reduced or, or aligned, um, processes streamlined is another one. And then like the number of people recruited, trained and managed. Um, I'm sure there are more, I know there are more, but just thinking of all the different ways that you have some type of numeric value. And the next bullet kind of talks through how to use it to your advantage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you want to make it the most compelling right. version of, of that. So, you know, we'll have students that maybe, um, you know, raised $8,000, right. you know, in some kind of 
whatever it is right. that they may have been doing some fundraiser that they were doing. But if they, the year before it was $4,000 that was raised, right. You don't want to say eight, eight thousand well, dollars. You want to say yeah. eight, like eight thousand dollars doesn't like eight thousand dollars is petty change to any larger enterprise. So better to say that I double we doubled revenue year over year or grew revenue by a hundred percent year over year. Those are the kinds of things. So whether it's money or participation or people, if there's a number and the number itself isn't really impressive, mm -hmm. better to show that you've grown the number than to oh. tell me the number. Right. For example, if you had a staff, you know, mm -hmm. um, we doubled in size, it might've been two to four yeah. instead of 200 to 400, but that that doubled in size has more, more cachet. Um, similarly, when you're looking at organizations, uh, by all accounts, it's better to use the umbrella larger organization. So one of the examples we'll be showing you um, with Roseanne was kind of working in a school, yeah. but putting the name of the school system, because technically she was volunteering for the school system. So it's just the example of saying, you know, Chicago Public Schools instead of Little Creek Elementary School. It just, again, for optics, that's the idea of that, creating the context that's most, uh, gonna most impress the reader, most engage the reader and make you sound the most, the, the strongest, the best. Yeah. And so I'm going to let my you take this line. last this is her, this this is her is line. I'm going to take it. Yeah. I have a lot of lines. Work is work, whether it's paid or unpaid. And I can tell you as a hiring manager, I don't really care if you were paid for it, if you can do it. I just need to know you can do it. Right. And you need to just trust me, trust us, trust the universe that if you can present this well, no one's going to care if you were paid or not. All right. And just doing this act, just going through this and seeing the value and what you've mm -hmm. done, that is going to grow your confidence. So if confidence is something that you're struggling with right now, this exercise is actually going to help you grow that mm -hmm. confidence because you're starting to see in black and white, wow, I did a lot and there's so much value to it. And now I can take that into the, you know, the next networking call that I have or the right. next interview that I go on. It takes a while. You're not going to get there today. Yes. But no. we're, we're getting it's a started. process. We're getting it started. It's a process. It is a process. All right. Okay. And then step five is to pull it all together and create what we're calling your brand. And we've really wrestled with this word because yeah. I hate commodifying a human, but it's just so broadly used that now we've kind of adopted it. But your brand is just what makes you unique, what you're trying to sell to the world for employment. Yeah. And the big piece is your story. Mm -hmm. You know, what is your story and how are you telling that story? So it's important to connect the dots. That's a, the phrase that we use in the course. Um, connect the dots between what you've done as a volunteer or a gig worker or a caregiver and what you did as a professional. Right. So for example, let's use the caregiving role because we right. did a workshop about a year ago, I think, mm -hmm. or last spring. And it was for people tackling really tricky breaks. So people yes. who couldn't volunteer or even work a day a year because they had really significant caregiving responsibilities. How do you translate that? One of them was a lawyer, right? And she had practiced law in 16 years. But during her break, she was advocating for a disabled family member, advocating for um, ADA compliance, for insurance company reimbursements. She was reading and reviewing right, the number of, of contracts. Mm -hmm. So so that was technically using her, her <laughs> legal skills. So you're thinking when you're connecting the dots, it's just making it really easy for the hiring manager because they don't have a whole lot of time to spend with you. Don't make me work too hard. Show me that you continued by focusing on those skills that A, I need, and B, you have, but I might not be able to see it really clearly unless you create that narrative. Yeah. And then when you're talking about yourself and talking about the work you've done, whether you're talking about a project that was paid or unpaid, use the STAR method, the, this was my situation, these are the tasks that I did, this is what I accomplished, and these were the results. So kind of what we've taken you through a little bit already, but really focusing on that little, um, what's that called, the mnemonic device? Yeah. The STAR to remember, situation, task, um, accomplishment and result. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one is, to oh, wait, just, and take credit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> important. One. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's extremely it important is. is to actually take credit. You solved the problem. You overcame the hurdle. Um, oftentimes as women will kind of give it away to mm -hmm. everybody else. It was everybody else that did it. No, you own that. Yeah. You were someone who, you know, was valuable and needed and necessary <laughs> in this, um, 
in yep. this situation. And you'll, as your confidence builds through this process, yeah. you're going to feel better doing that. At the beginning, for a lot of you, it's going to feel really inauthentic to, and boastful. Yeah. But I mean, if you're not being boastful when you're pitching yourself out there, then I mean, you're not well, doing your job. I always say, even you thinking you're being boastful is probably, it's probably not, not enough. Boastful, yeah, it's boastful true. enough. So it's true. just know that talking about yourself can feel extremely uncomfortable, especially when you have, you know, been focused on everyone else. It's easier to talk about what's going on with our children mm -hmm. or what's happening for our, you know, our spouse or, you know, a family member. It, it really is a challenge. And we understand that like from the inside out, we understand how hard it is to talk about yourself, but you're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. You're going to do it anyway, because that is how you're going to grow your confidence through this process. Right. So if you're going to be talking about yourself, you need to know who you're talking to. So, so your true. audience is the next place. And people make that mistake all the time. Yeah. We used to call it back in the day, I worked in tech and I ran a sales organization and I'd say, don't do the stop me when you hear something you like pitch. Yeah. Cause you're going to lose me. So knowing what your audience is, who your audience is, who you're trying to reach, and then what do they want to hear? Mm -hmm. What do they need to hear from you? So using my lawyer example, if she's, if she's not looking to work in law anymore, maybe she wants to get into business development, she's going to change it. She's like, she can't change her history, right. but she's going to change the way she pitches it. She's going to talk more about advocacy, about public speaking, about persuasion, about making presentations, because those are elemental to sales. If she's looking to get into legal contracts, she's going to get in the weeds a little bit more talking about contractual language and finding inconsistencies and rewriting contracts. So really being mindful of who you want to talk to and making sure that that story is, is being spoken in their language, basically. Yeah. 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 And then the last place is the platforms. What platforms are you going to be right. speaking on. So, so they're kind of, there's a story part of all right. of them. You've got your resume. That's where you're going to be. That's, it's still a very essential document. We thought maybe 20 years ago, when we thought we were going to go to the paperless office. We thought we were going to do away with resumes too, but that hasn't happened. Then your LinkedIn profile and what other relevant social media outlets work for you and in your industry. And then learning how to tell your story through conversation and not just in interviews, but on networking calls. So you can get people to help you get in front of interviewers. Okay. okay. All right, so the, the next thing that we decided to include in this webinar today is the illustrations of real life mm -hmm. women, just like you, that have gone out there, used this method, yeah. and it's worked for them. So yeah. we want to break it down for we you. We had so many. It was hard picking three. I know. We wanted to pick three who were different and um, went into different things for different reasons and also different geographies, the whole thing. So Kristen, at the time that she uh, was with us, she was in California. Yeah. Um, having been in, she was, where was she? She was in Europe, I thought. Yeah, she yeah. was. She was in Belgium, but she was somewhere in Africa before that. So her husband had an international job and she was traveling about, moving about every 18 months. So, and we also do a lot of work with military spouses who do the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so Kristen had a 14 year break or maybe 16. Um, and she had no paid work experience. We're going to look at how she used this process to pitch herself. Right. And then Nicole, she was a freelance writer and mom with the appearance of what looked like job hops. Like they didn't make sense. Yes. Um, in an eight year break that she took. And so she was actually making a really big pivot. And so we're going to show you how, how, how she, she did, did that. She did a beautiful job. With it. Um, she did. And then Roseanne, who we just mentioned <laughs> earlier, um, which is a single parent with um, an 18 year break again no time for volunteer experience because she had two preemie sons that she was raising on her own and um both of them with moderate um learning needs but one who significant. had some significant needs and um so let's just hop off so we're gonna get out of here and i already loaded up my linkedin people so okay let's get out of here all right so this is kristen this is the first one so Kristen, you can see it's a beautiful LinkedIn and that she did with, with us in the course, but the purpose of showing this is just to kind of give you her story. So she's a writer and editor, copywriter and creative communicator. I think the best thing to do to kind of see how she linked it all together is but to read. This is that idea of connecting right. the dots. Right. That's something that we want you to really start to get into your mind of, I need to connect the dots. Exactly. For, um, the so let's take a look over here at experience. Right now, she is working in the development office of George Washington University. And a little footnote there, when she registered, when she was in our course, yeah. she was in California. Yeah. 
And she didn't want to start applying. She was in the winter, right about now. She was yeah. in the winter cohort. Um, she said, well, I'm going to take the course. We're not going to start applying to September when we move to DC, because that's where they were going to be landing, hopefully for a while. Yeah. And we encouraged her to do it anyway. And, you know, we said, you don't have to tell them where you live. Nobody needs to know where you live. Just, mm -hmm. Anyway, they, they hired her and she said, well, I'm really excited about it. They made her the offer. She said, um, I won't be moving until DC until September. This was probably May. And they said, great, you can work remotely. If she had led with, I live in California, I can't work, you know, I can't be apologizing for all the they reasons never it's going to be a burden for them. But okay. take a look at this right here. So Steele and Hatcher. So Steele is her maiden name, her married name. Hatcher, no, that's her maiden name. Hatcher is her, her, her married name, creative services. Let's take a look at what she did so we can just kind of unpack it. Copy edited home, these, these children books, these children's books that were written by her sister. All right. Um, curriculum that she developed for international students that was as a volunteer in the, in the kids international school. Um, again, mentoring kids in the school, crafted promotional pieces for a rent, revenue generating rental property. So they owned a home one place when they moved and before they sold it, they rented it. Okay, so this sounds really good, but and, and it was really good, but you and I know it was not as bold as maybe it sounds. It was just enough to take this last work experience in 2004 and make it palatable to somebody, okay? Um, I just I, just yeah. a note, just a committee yeah. liaison, if you if you look, that committee liaison, um, you know, when you are now currently in a space where you are not working, any room <laughs> in your schedule that you make for a volunteer position should mm -hmm. be something that you are thinking, how can I leverage this? Right. How so you're not volunteering to staff box in the library unless you yes. want to be a library scientist. Yes. You're volunteering to do something that's in your lane, which is what clearly what what, what Kristen did. Yeah. And she wrote this beautiful statement, which I won't read, but I want you to look at like she's popping out these skills. Now she had not done these things in almost 15 years as a professional. No, it was more than that. It was 2004. Mm -hmm. So it was like 17 years when she came to the course. Very important to know the most important part is your smiling face, that she is now working in a great job, a big job with a team at, that she manages at the um, George Washington University. And they are so lucky to yeah, have her. For sure. <laughs> All right, here's another one. Here is Nicole. Nicole. So Nicole had a very different situation. As Kelly mentioned, she was a freelance writer. She was a mom of one child. She also had some health issues that she was dealing with. So family she had all kinds of family, family, family members. It's just like she had a lot going on. So Nicole started her career as a scientist in a lab um, at PECOM, which is the Philadelphia Children's Hospital, really well, well respected. And she was doing, um, as a lab scientist, doing um, experiments for the physicians in research. She loved it. Um, but it was taxing for her. She wanted something she can control when she had a child. So she got a master's of writing. Yep. And she started doing technical writing as a freelancer, which she loved. But the problem with the technical writing as a freelancer is there were no boundaries. Right. Um, it was during COVID when she came to us and her child was home. And she's like, I need to get something where I get out of my head. Yeah. And the other thing is that I've experienced, so have you. When you're self-employed, there are no boundaries. No. And now her son was about nine years old. She didn't want to just always be, oh, hang on a second. I'll be right there. He was an only child. So she said, she did her research and she said, you know what I want? I want a job where I can just go to work and leave and never think about it again. Yep. Um, no pressure, no. She wanted the structure mm -hmm. of she wanted the the every day and the social She wanted to be with connection. people. Yep. So she did her research. And for some people it might've seemed kind of odd because she's got a master's in science and a master's in writing, but she decided she wanted to be a medical coding specialist, which is the person who works in the medical office and codes things appropriately. So the insurance companies can reimburse the, either the, um, the provider or the um, patient, depending on how the, the, the link goes. Um, so she went ahead and got a certificate and obviously sailed through that because it was very easy. But when we mentioned the job hops, now we're looking at someone who, lab scientist, writer, medical coding bill and billing specialist, it makes no sense. So I do want to read you her, because this is how she connects the dots. I'm a certified medical coding and billing specialist, excited to pivot into the field. So she doesn't have the experience at the time, but she had the degree. And she's owning the pivot. She's exactly right up front. Right up front. 
Um, but I'm really so much more. While earning my degree in biology, I held a number of customer service positions in office supply, pharma, and restaurant change, chains. Managers and customers alike appreciate my efficiency, resourcefulness, and unique ability to calm ruffled feathers. If you have ever called the office to challenge a medical bill, you know what these people must feel like. Because even you who are very nice, when you're not getting a bill paid properly and it's a big one you're taking it out on this poor person so this was important for her to mention this experience that she had in college because it ties together connects those dots um, I enjoyed three years as a microbiology lab assistant at PCOM, where doctors described me as meticulous and focused and favored me because I made sure the experience, experiments were done correctly and the results were beyond reproach Hoping to create a bridge between scientists and the rest of us, I pursued a master's in science writing and have enjoyed a thriving medical career since. So now she's made, there's a typo there, but anyway, but now she's connecting that dot. Okay, so now I'm taking all my science knowledge, but I'm gonna apply it so people, other people can understand it. Now I'm excited to bring all of these skills and experiences together to help your organization produce the most clean claims efficiently and with a smile on my face. Yeah. So and she did what would not have been done by anybody looking at this. Anybody looking at her resume would have thought this makes no sense. Yeah. But she connected the dots mm -hmm. and here's the other piece of it. She owned the narrative. And that is part of what you need to come at this with. Yeah. It's not because if you read some of those lines, you might think, oh my gosh, like if I was writing that about myself, that would feel like I was bragging mm -hmm. or I was over speaking. Mm -hmm. No. You have to own the narrative and explain to the world who you are yeah. and why this does actually make sense. That is on you to yeah. do in this process and do it in a way that they can have confidence in you and confidence in, in hiring exactly. you as an employee. Now, a couple of things to notice here, actually, her real gap is even longer. She came to us in 2021, I think, Yeah, or 2020. Um, she did this, and now, and this is another thing. This 2022. Okay. Um, no, she came to us in 21. She got the job in 22. Okay. But but what was important here is that because it took her a little while, it took her about six months. Um, is that this was really part time. I mean, by the time she came to us, she was not really doing it at all. Yeah. But she still had her, you know, her shingle out, so to speak. But then the other piece that's important to see is this. And the interesting thing is when this, she had a real value for mental health because her fan, she had seen some family members struggle with mental health issues during COVID. What's interesting here is that they jumped her right away. So she's not only doing the coding and the billing, but she's also taking full of all client care. So it's post, um, post visit stuff. It's pre visit stuff. It's family intervention stuff because it's a mental health facility. Great job. She's so happy. Yeah. Okay. I'm proud so of she, she got all, all that she wanted and more. Yeah. And then last is Roseanne. Um, we always call Roseanne. Her, 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 her quote, her I quote know. is like just so her. Too. So we mentioned earlier about Roseanne. She um, was divorced as a very young mom with twins um, who were called micro preemies. I'd never heard that before, but that's like <laughs> even more premature than preemies. And she was the sole provider for them and um, so caregiver for them. So she stopped working completely and was a full-time mom for two children who had some significant needs. And I want you to notice what she did here because when she came, she was like, what on earth am I going to say? 12 years, Chicago public schools, mm -hmm. right? She felt, nobody questioned this. She interviewed a lot of places. Nobody questioned that she put Chicago public schools. Nobody challenged her. Nobody gave her a hard time because she was working in the Chicago public schools as an advocate. doesn't matter that she wasn't paid. She's talking about, you know, her stuff as PTO and, and parent liaison and then her parent advocate piece, um, as advocating not only for her sons, but for all the children around and after them who need those same kinds of services. She took, right before our course, she took a project right here. Remember we mentioned that example of like working trade shows? Mm -hmm. So she did this, this is for a friend. This was not a big job. This was something that she did periodically for a friend, but this is the more important part. She landed a job at a tech company. She had no tech experience. She worked in transport, transportation, major shipping company back when the bills were done on a, you know, a triplicate form, which is on here, right? Because yeah, what was the name of the company? CXS Transportation. Yeah. yeah. Here it is. All right here. This company, she was there. 
two years there and then she was four years here, but she was working in it back when everything was done manually. Mm -hmm. And now she gets to join this company where everything is done either on a phone or on a laptop or an iPad. Everything is like real time. What's interesting is that that wasn't a problem for them because one of the things we talk about a lot is it's really valuable to understand how things were done before they came, became automated. It's like the example, like when my kids are writing an essay, I always say, sit down and write down your points, right? Write down what you want to talk about. Right. And then start construction, constructing your essay. Mm -hmm. um, go to the library, get some researches, go online. Don't just dive in. It's the same idea. She understood the whole process, all the different pieces of moving a large piece of equipment right. from Belgium to, you know, California. Um, whereas the people, the young digital natives that she was thinking she couldn't compete with, they didn't understand that. They right. just knew, oh, if I push this button, it's going to happen. Yeah. So there is value in understanding the process and then learning the tools. And it did not take her long. No. And she was very low tech no. to yeah. um to learn. Right. So, so we are we even ahead of schedule. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. Right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm around my computer here. Uh full screen. Where is it? slide sorter of view hmm. oh maybe to click it slideshow right there slideshow yeah okay um so you meant the oops <laughs> this is the, the this limitation is, of our we're low tech well. too <laughs> all right well that's okay because we have Meg we have Megan let's go that's the thing you can't just jump back to the slide you left though you've got to go through them all there, so there might be a way but well, we don't know it <laughs> if you know it please feel free to write it in the chat and tell us <laughs> educate yeah. us educate us we would like that but you got to give us some some cred for these nice slides. Okay. No, I'm very, I'm very proud of you. I think I look pretty. So these are the three essential messages of any career break story. Yeah. This is really important um, language for you to grasp onto mm -hmm. as you're speaking about this. Mm -hmm. So I love how you lay this out. So yep. talk them through. So this. the first thing is I loved my work and I was really good at it. It was a sacrifice to leave. And just remember that, even though I know I really wanted, I wanted to be with my kids, it was still a sacrifice to leave a big job and a big paycheck. It was a sacrifice to leave, but given my alternatives at the time, it was the right decision and I'm glad I made it. So you're not apologizing. You're educating them that, you know what? I left something big I was really good at, it, good at, and now I'm ready to get back. I'm confident in my decision. Yeah. The second piece, I tapped into even perfected all of those professional skills and experiences that I had in my paid work throughout um, through the throughout my break with community and caregiving and advocacy roles. And I learned some new ones too. So I'm relevant. And then the third piece is I am so excited to get back to bring all of my professional training and success, plus these new skills I have honed as a community leader. Um, to the workplace and that's why I'm here today. So when you are speaking, when you are networking, when you are interviewing, you want to make sure that you are hitting on all three of these aspects mm -hmm. as you're um, sharing your message exactly. with them. Um, and then a few more ground rules. When you present your break, you wanna present them in the same kind of way that you would present your work, your professional work pre-break. So just as we said before, Focus on actions, not responsibilities. Look at that context and scale. How can I present my accomplishments in the most compelling way? Right. Um, and always looking at anything that you can show yeah. as a as a measurable accomplishment. Yep. Um, and you're going to call it a career break and a pause. Or not. It's right. your choice. So right. when you get to the point, some of you may be there already when you're making your LinkedIn yeah. profile, you can choose career break, career pause. Our students chose not to do it. It's a, it's a six to one has to have dozen the other. If you were you know, working on Wall Street, managing a, you know, billion dollar portfolio. And now your resume says freelance project manager and the projects you're running are, you know, helping a small business manage the books. I'm going to know something happened there. Um, so whether you call it a break or not, it's your choice. It's not going to hurt you either way. The only thing that will hurt you is if you just say, I took a career break and then don't show me that you did something. Yeah. Because the bottom line is I don't want to hire someone who isn't industrious. I don't want to hire the mother who stayed home and played tennis and went out to lunch and didn't use her skills in some way. Not because I'm, you know, un unkind towards someone who makes that choice, but because you're not honing any skills by doing that. Right. Right. And again, this you speaking about it is going to give you the confidence that is going to come through when you're talking to these people because you believe that this work was valuable. That's right. Okay. 
Uh, wait, we didn't, oh, wait, we didn't you want to introduce that experience early in the conversation. Um, here. Yeah, it's right there. Click it. Um, so, so this is, I always say above the fold. I'm um, thinking of Teresa. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. We, had, we had one student who had a really senior finance career in LA and like all the big production companies. <laughs> um, and then she had some really great volunteer experience. But because she had a 20 year gap, the whole first page of her resume was all of that volunteer experience, which was great. She was presidents of things and on executive boards. But her last job was, I think, at Sony and it was falling to the second page. So you need to make sure when I say introduce early, make sure that early enough in the conversation or early enough on your LinkedIn profile yeah. or early enough on your resume, I can see, yeah, you did all this stuff with the junior league and with the Girl Scouts, but you also worked at Sony, right? right? right. So that's that's kind of the early piece. Yeah. And never, ever, ever, ever apologize for taking time off to care for family. We only survive as a community, yep. as an economy, as a species, right? through the generation of women who have children. Yeah. We should not be apologizing for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, this is the conversation Kat and I were having too, like, yep. you know, you have allowed us to further our careers, exactly. or, you know, um, and having been on both sides of the fence, we understand. Exactly. That. Just one more slide. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I just want, I want to get to questions. I know we're there. We're there. Excited. Um, but this is important. <laughs> we want to make sure that you can always find us by some version of this, this, handle prepare to launch you um hopefully you're watching us on youtube because we provide a ton of free content there it's good stuff and we us also often include like a downloadable pdf for you to work on and um, we have stuff on our website if you feel like right now you're ready to bring in, bring in your career launch the right way with our help then you can come to our info session on january 24th and we're going to let um megan talk a megan bit. talk a little bit about those dates since we don't know them yep and then we're gonna do questions yeah thanks meg all right. Hey, everybody. Yeah, so they have an information session coming up this time next week. It's on Tuesday, January 24th, 12 Eastern. Um, I will pop the registration link in the chat right now. Um, if you have, a lot of you have, have seen Kelly and Susan before. If you've taken one of their spot courses on their LinkedIn or Resume Gap Lab or anything like that, and you've paid for it, they will give you a refund toward that amount um, if you sign up for their class. Um, the career relaunch cohort. Um, so let me get that link for you in the chat. Does anybody have any questions? I see Kelly B has a question in the chat. I just want to say, Trisha, I love this. Yeah, yeah. good job, Trisha. Where's Trisha? Trisha, right here. Yeah, Where? right there. Your honor. I'm on your, your, oh. your cursor. Hi, Trisha. I'm just so impressed. So Trisha wants to connect with all of you on LinkedIn to get to that critical mass. So that's great. That's a great step. Yeah. And just to clarify, the info session is a one hour Q&A featuring a few students that talks about our 10 week career launch program. We take I mean, we may take two cohorts. We may only have room for one because we have three others from another source. Um, but if you're at all interested in the program, want to learn about it, come to this session because that's where you kind of get the full the full story on it. Yeah. OK, so Kelly B, her question is. Um, when your volunteer experience is overlapping, i.g. serving on multiple boards at the same time, do you recommend that your resume is sorted by position or by skill? So what, what Kelly is talking about is what's called a functional resume where you kind of organize by a skill set or an experience set. No, because you always got to think about what's easiest for the resume reader. And the resume reader wants to see a, a, just a standard chronological resume. So it doesn't matter if the skills overlap. If you've, if you've done, one of the things we teach in our course, I can't really teach it right now because it's a little more specific, but the idea is if you've had multiple experiences, maybe a couple of gigs and a lot of volunteer leadership, that you just create a fake umbrella company, which is what Kristen did. Yeah. Um, that's ex exactly, if you look at Kristen, you can look at it again just by Googling her on or looking her up on LinkedIn, you can see how she did it. Create an umbrella and then list all of them together. You should not be putting months ever on a resume. It should only be years. Um, years gives you a little bit more fluidity and the ability to stretch things a little bit more. So that's not a problem. Um, don't worry about the dates. If you're doing that kind of work, you can either truncate one if you're concerned about having them look like a progression or just put them all under one umbrella like Kristen did. I did this for these years and these are the things that I did. Great. Okay. 
All right, this is a great question. So from Stephanie, what if you took a year off that started as family caregiving, but took advantage of that year off to pursue personal projects like a large genealogy research project that involved traveling? Would you also mention that? So Stephanie, if you only took a year off, you don't need to do anything on your resume or your LinkedIn. I mean, one year is fine. And, and especially during COVID, I, I would argue that the two years of COVID, if you took a break, then no one's going to question you about that. Everybody knows half the world took it off. So I think that that's a cool thing to include in a conversation. I was just going to say. Um, I think it might be a cool thing to include at the bottom of a resume. Not everybody is a proponent of putting in interests or hobbies. I loved it. I got to tell you, I worked in tech and that was like the first thing I looked at because I knew by the time they were coming to me that they checked the basic boxes. I wanted to know about the person I was hiring. So I really like looking at that. Um, so that might be something that you eat, that you include there if you have that section, but I wouldn't put it in your experience because it's unnecessary and it might detract from some of the other more um, relevant work skills. The only exception would be that if your career is as a researcher, then I would put it there because you were doing research. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Uh, the next question, when I discovered your free course on LinkedIn, one of your suggestions of networking with old colleagues was daunting because the last thing I want is anyone to know that I was out of work for five years because I got retrenched. I saw it as a break for myself, but then my mom took ill and a few uh, in a few months then turned into COVID oh, that right. followed. Um, I then checked the website of one of the old companies I worked at and they had a job available that she wants to apply for. Okay. But I don't know how to approach my previous manager and thought ex-colleagues likely would be judgy. Yeah, there's a lot of okay. saboteurs in there. <laughs> sure. So Kelly works yeah. on the course a lot on mindset. Like how do you counter those? mindsets. I think the easiest thing to say without letting her do her magic is to say that we don't give people enough credit. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people, would you do that? Where's Tasneem? Right here. Right here. Tasneem, would you do that? Would you, if some, let's say the roles this were flipped, Stephanie. say that you stayed at the company for five years and one of your old colleagues who you liked reached out, would you have an attitude towards her? Would you be judgy? I'm going to answer for you if you don't have your sound on. No, of course you wouldn't. None of us would. Mm -hmm. So we judge ourselves very harshly and we assume other people are going to judge, judge us as or more harshly, but they don't. I have an old employee that I fired, that I had to fire because he wasn't performing well and I demoted him to another department. This was 20, how old Stucker? 28, 29 years ago. He still calls me for a recommendation about every like eight years. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember him. I remember I fired him yeah. and he still calls me for recommendation because I loved him. He was just in the wrong role and I moved him into a role that was better. Yeah. It doesn't feel like 28 years since I've seen Paul Sweet. It feels like, you know, I, I remember everything about him. Five years is a blip. It's nothing. And I, th the thing I want to say about this, because this is very common. So I don't want you to feel like you are alone in feeling that way. I actually saw people's heads shaking yeah. as, as um, we were reading that section, that question. Um, Here's what I want to say to it. Create a history for yourself that debunks that thought. And the only way you're going to do that is by reaching out to someone yeah. and making that connection again. If you did good work, and even I suppose if you didn't right. do great work, yeah. um, just reconnecting with someone and having that conversation again and creating a new history in your head. We've And, and I'm not saying this to be foo-foo about it. I'm saying this because our students, our clients that we have had now for almost 12 mm -hmm. years between the work that we've done in this space, they do this and then it doesn't, I don't have to say one word of magic to no. them because- Well, you do to get them to make that call. Yes, because all you're doing is saying to yourself, well, yeah, I remember the time that I reached out to um, Kim Beck and she was so happy to hear from me again. And I, I like, I know that I can do that. And then the worst case scenario is that they ghost you. And then that rejection is something that you just pivot and you keep moving. But it rarely happens. And yeah. often when they think they're ghosted, it's just that the person wants to get back to you when they have time to write a thoughtful response and they don't have that time for two months and then they reach out to you later. Um, so what would be a suggestion? Well, number one is really working on those three um, those three mm -hmm. um, things that we talked about when you're telling your story right, because to the then manager. When Kazmin called them, she has something to say. You know, I ended up taking a career break, a, a, a brief break. 
COVID took over and it was just better for me to be home during that time. And I'm so excited to get back. I loved working with you guys. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to, to learn more about this role and see if it's a good fit for me yeah. and, and keep that again, that, that little choice of words to see if it's a good fit for me, as opposed to, I'm going to claw my way back in. I hope you guys remember me and give me, throw me a bone. Yeah. It's do, not that. Do not lead with the energy that you have to apologize for this time. What you did was really mm -hmm. valuable and very important and honored values of who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. There is no apology in that. You made the right choice. And then, yes, did we all know that we were going to go through a pandemic? No, but we kind of all get a free pass because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So those years are a little bit, you know, less important. And also tells me if you go back and look at the, um, the slide where it talks about like the three parts of the career story, the you know what, I ended up having to take some time off for some family issues and then COVID hit. And it was a really hard decision to make because I loved work, imagining that you're talking to your old employer. I loved working with you. I loved the company, um, but it was the right decision at the time. And now, you know, I've taken my skills, I've brushed them up or I've done this extra work, whatever, however you're going to pitch yourself. Um, and I'm really ready to get back. And I'm hoping that I can be top of your list when you start making your list of candidates to interview. Great. All right. Um, I have my own consulting company that I used for gig work, but took two plus years off to care for my father during COVID. The company provides cover for the gap, but wonder if it should still, if I still mention trying to get back into the full-time workforce. So Bridget, I think what I would do in your case, I might just put COVID caregiving break and then put um, select freelance work engagements include and then put a couple on there so could they think in your case the consulting piece especially if it was significant work should be on there um if it wasn't if it wasn't aligned with what you want to do or wasn't anything you're particularly proud of then don't but it sounds like you are and that's the way i would handle that okay great um i've re-entered the invest um i have re-entered the investment industry previously Good. successful um then during COVID, i took a pause after working seven years in capital yeah, markets okay. Um, my job was relocated and I could not move because I had high school students yep, and yep, all of that. And finding um, the investment industry is less friendly to reentry because it tends to be male dominated and there is less of a tendency for men to take a pause. Yep. Um, have you seen women reenter this industry successfully after COVID? Um, it could be a real pivot. Well, I, my, husband's com my husband's company is a good example of that. But right. So well, well, first of all, you never want to pivot because you're not being invited to the lunch table. You pivot because you want to pivot. All right. Um, yes, we absolutely have people we have. I can think of just one right now who was in capital markets who would went to work for, I think, Morgan Stanley. Yeah. So yeah, people get it. But I think I don't know you, Amy. Um, I will not disagree that financial services is a little slightly different animal, but if it really, really depends on how you're pitching it. And, um, you know, you may want to consider joining the course because you'll really learn how to do that. At the very least, go on YouTube and try to look for the ones where we're talking about making a pitch because the way you deliver it will determine how well it's received and what action takes place. And when you're dealing with an audience of people who are shrewd, um, tough negotiators, <laughs> You got to make sure that you're matching that energy. Yep. And there may be like a little apology that's coming out when you come, when you go in there. It may be that you're not being boastful enough or strong enough in the interview. I can't unpack that right now without knowing you, but I would not say it's time for a pivot unless you want to pivot, unless you want to change. Your break is so short. It should not matter. Okay, um, I left a corporate job to stay home with my first child. I also know that I wanted to keep a foot in the door. So I started working part-time remote job that stayed until 2021. When the company changed their flexible scheduling and were preparing well to what you were going to welcome your yeah. child. And now I'm looking for another part-time position. Should I address that year? Okay. No. no, already this is too much information. I don't even need to know that. Yeah, yeah. right. You, you haven't been out long. It's fine. Just yeah. either start your resume in 2021 or whatever. Or if you want to put COVID pause, even though it wasn't really COVID or just career pause for that one year, don't worry about that. That's not going to be a problem. Yeah. Now, what Kelly said at the beginning, there will be a problem. Most of you will never get through an, AT an applicant tracking system, whether it be a company site or an Indeed or even LinkedIn. They're not made for people who don't have a very predictable chronology with nothing different. 10% of people maybe get yeah. through. So don't Network. write, don't, don't be thinking about your story for an algorithm, thinking about your, think about your story for a human, a human being. And we got to hop off. Yes, I know. I know. But let's just grab this one live. But okay. Um, I noticed the examples highlighted had freelance. Is it better to put freelance versus self-employed if I don't, um, 
want to highlight my brain. I think it's different if you're it's because they are different. Freelance means I'm picking up projects. I'm helping this person write work. I'm helping this person train their salespeople. Whatever I'm doing. I have background is investment banking and corporate. Oh, that's right. well, that's <laughs> nice to hear. Yes. Um, <laughs> Self-employment would be more that I designed a product and I was selling it. So if it was projects, it's freelance. If it's self-employed, it would be then this company, this product, this one product I was selling. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's it. We actually have we another call. We wish you could stay longer with all of you, but thank you so much for being here today. This is a great way to start your 2023 mm -hmm. career relaunch. And um, we hope that we will see you in That's our web sure. somewhere. And Megan, night. will you be sending them a follow-up email so they have all that information? Yes. Yeah, so you'll recording. get an email today with the recording for those of you Good. who could make it live. And then I'll include um, the links for the upcoming events. Thank great. you.